in um, Style Wars, right? Scene is at the wall painting next to um, Duster. Yeah. And he's going, your first outline's always needed, he says. You can't just go and colour in in the air. You can't just fill in in the air. And we go, right, OK. We're not going to do a first <laughs> outline anymore. We're going to just fill in in the air. And then he said, you've got to have your cloud and whatever, you know, like your 3D and things like that. And we go, right, we're not doing those anymore. So we were reactionarily sort of uh, going, right, we're not going to, we're not going traditional anymore. We're going to go opposite to what scene said and hopefully grow our own thing. That's incredible. Killer Killer Podcast. Killer Killer Official Street Culture TV. Instagram UK Frontline. Beatbox created. Killer Killer. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Killer Podcast. Yes, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Killer Podcast live and direct to the new home, the legendary Chrome and Black, Hackney, hold tight, zombie. Our sponsors, the mighty GK Nifty Heads, have a massive 100,000 play to earn NFTs to give away to the streets. Just hit the link in the description or go to gknifteyheads.com and get ready for Hoddle Wars Summer 2024. <laughs> if you're a share and caring, you know what's been going on over the last 500 episodes. Big up yourselves and thank you so much humbly for all your services to the community in the wider reaches of uh, street culture. Serves you all right. Um, inside the house, I am very, it's like I'm a kid again. Uh, me and my friend here go a long way back, uh, to say the least. Um, Brighton uh, is where he is from um, and a creative starburst of all manner of output in the world of hip hop, alternative, graffiti, you name it. He goes by the name of Rec. Hi, Keller. <laughs> R-E-Q. Yeah. R-E-Q for those that are yeah. Yeah, uneducated. How are you? All right, yeah, yeah. I've come all the way up to London. <laughs> I walked from Farringdon. It was quite a long way. It's a nice day out there. Farringdon to, to Hackney is a long way. It was like over an hour, but I, I didn't really know where I was going. Really? But it's nice being in Chrome and Black. The trains go over there. Yeah. And it feels really urban. You know, it's not like where I'm from at all. No, it's like a complete offset. You know, complete opposite, isn't it? Yeah. What's Brighton saying at the moment? Well, it's the same. as Well, it's not really, is it? <laughs> all, all of our good halls of fame have gone, mm. pretty much. Yeah. The moon's been buried. Well, the moon got changed into a warehouse space or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then um, Black Rock is buried under soil landscape gardening. Wow, really? Mm. I mean, it was an episode. It was it was one hell of a community in the nineties, wasn't it? Yeah, well, it just shows that you need those spaces. You need the spaces to paint, mm. and then you've got the community that rises up around it. Mm. Yeah, if we hadn't had that and Tarna Land, we used to have those little, little four-foot boards. They yeah. were like our kind of testing pad back in the... Mm. in. The, well, that was from 89 onwards. Mm. Mm. I distinctively remember maybe 95, 94. Young Killer Kelly, I understand, coming into <laughs> Brighton. <laughs> well, you, you weren't really a killer back then. You were just Keller. You were just Keller. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's only later on you. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I was, a, I was a mop. I was a member of public. Um, <laughs> but then, um, you know, I, I get to some, like, you know, dilapidated area. I can't remember it was. And I see fuckest uppest. Oh, yeah. Rick, she, and these amazing, like, like Martians and you know stars and she, I'm sure you know you might remember it, but it was incredible. And I just you know jaw dropped. Oh, uh, we, we had that spot called David Door Road and, and TFU. The fuck is up is we did a production there. It wasn't with she actually. Who was it? He had moved on. Jace. That's it. And um, Visor Kev. Vinny Nylon. Nylon. He was right in Buick. We all had different names in TFU. <laughs> really? We were the fuckest up so we had to have fucked up names, yeah. <laughs> it was part of the mandatory, the mm. mandate of being in TFU. No, but the idea sort of was that we could get, anybody could join the crew if we liked them. Mm -hmm. uh, if they were a bit shit, then they can be shit. So Visor, he was doing the shittest stuff. <laughs> and it was all right. And it was yeah. all good. Yeah, but Jace, if you remember Jason Brashill. He was 2000 AD. Serious cat. Comic book 
illustrator, yeah. Yeah, and I might just add at this point, big up Euro, because, uh, you know, he connected dots. He did. Um, indeed, and he, he mentioned that. Well, yeah, because we had the two crews. We had TDK, which is the Dusty Knights, and then we had TFU. TDK was for the more expensive-looking um, <laughs> The top end pieces. stuff. That's right, yeah, yeah. And Jace was doing some really good stuff. And also his friend Jim Murray, who worked, was an illustrator for... 2000 AD, he'd never used spray paint before and he just picked it up in an afternoon and he was doing just the craziest character. How does a person do that? I mean, just just the, you know, the, the ease of dropping into a... If you know how to layer up the colours, then you're already halfway there and the rest is on and off. I mean, really, it's the on and off synchronisation that's the big problem with spray paint, isn't it? Yeah, and the lines, making sure that the lines are tight and things like kind that. Kind of, yeah. Well, does that not matter? It doesn't have to because uh, I don't really paint linear with lines anymore. Hey, we've gone right into a good one. I like this. Yeah, sort of you already. <laughs> but but what I want to know because I've forgotten is where did I first meet you? Where was that? It was in a youth club in mid Sussex somewhere. Yeah, where was that's it? right. It was in a place called Billingshurst. That's uh, right. Was it Billingshurst? I, yeah, I was four, 14, 13 or fourteen years old. So I thought I was the bump king, but you no, actually... I am the, the bump king. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let the podcast confuse you. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. man, it was mad. Um, and I was probably like one of eight kids at this youth centre. Yeah. Um, and well, you... I only remember you, but I know there were other people there, but you were the one that wasn't just there. You wanted to be there. You had skill already, so, yeah. I appreciate that, being so young and seeing... An, you know, a, a sound a production system. I think it was an MPC, it may have been an MPC. Yeah, I must have borrowed that from Russ Rockwell because I've never owned Russ, yeah. I, I've never owned an MPC. So I must have taken that with me and sampled you beatboxing. And then I think you just you just sometimes need that example, don't you, of what what could be done. Yeah, but then when I think of that time, and bearing in mind the age I was, like I just I just thought Rec was. A, a beat maker, producer, DJ. Ah, uh, yeah. But but then you then when I get to Brighton, I'm like, hold on a minute, the the, the penny's dropping here. Mm. Like you're multi talented. Oh well. Yeah, but if you grew up in that era of hip hop, you were looking up the five elements as it came to be known. So I did a bit of body popping. I didn't really do break dancing, but graffiti, yeah. DJing, cutting breaks. Um, so we're already looping up breaks. We were doing, you know, everyone was doing that. Um, in, a, in a way, collecting records, doing graffiti outlines. But really, I come from a visual art side of things. Mm. So the graffiti, I was already an artist before I got into graffiti. So I could already draw portraits and stuff like that. So in a way, graffiti was a little bit of a kind of a hobby. Really, so it was it was easy. It was a bit easy for me, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I guess with the five elements, as you mentioned, it because we're going back of an age where, and I I hold I I like think I hold a certain level of crown to it. If you're if if you're part of that, what's the I guess the the, the creative spiritual guide is hip hop. By default, you know you do lend your hand to the other disciplines, hmm. even if you're like you know you may not be you know, savvy or, you know, top of your game, in it, but you've got to have an appreciation for it, haven't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because every, you're a kind of, uh, you're like a crew with all the different people fulfilling different roles. Mm -hmm. So we, we've, in them days, in the, in the early 80s, virtually no one was rapping because they didn't like the sound of their English voices. But later on, the English people found their voices. And yeah. So, uh, then proper... British hip hop started being made, it got made, didn't it? Yeah, but there was also, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, you done, you did stuff on Cat Skills as well, didn't you? What did you do? Because there's a bunch of record labels um, in on South Coast. It wasn't Cat Skills, no. Um, I, I got signed to Skint. Skint. No, that's yeah. a one. So what happened was, I'll, I'll just give you a quick little. I, I'd done a an, a twelve inch cover for a band called RPM who were signed to Mo Wax, and then Swifty who designed Mo Wax sleeves was doing this Foster's Eye street art thing around London. And he got me to paint one of these billboards. I got £2,000 to paint it, and I bought a sampler and a drum machine with that money. Ah. And that was what made... That's how I started my music. That's incredible. 
That's amazing. Um, so up until that point, you weren't really making beats like that? No, no. But I had quite a good schooling. Um, I'll have to rewind even further then. 85, yeah, 85, Norman Cook, who was in the House Martins at the time, he was putting on hip hop, hip hop jams in Brighton, cutting breaks and it's a lot of good old school heads and stuff like that. Anyway, we became friends and he started inviting me in the studio while he was making his albums. So I'd go and make tea and just watch how things were going. And if he wasn't sure about a certain bit, he'd look at me and go, to see if my foot was tapping or, you know, I was... You were the old grey whistle test, basically. Something like that, yeah, yeah. Which was good, because, you know, I, I found out a lot of stuff, so I knew what all the mixing desk and all the effects were doing, and it was all real to real back then, you know. Wow. And, and he went on to do some mad stuff. And... Yeah, but even on the back of that, I ended up becoming the stage painter for Beats International, so we went to many countries around the world with me behind the drummer doing live spray paint pieces. That happened? Mm. That's insane. You wouldn't get it now, would you? No. It would be like three uh, eight by four boards behind the drummer, spray paint. No, it wouldn't happen just because of the smell. You know, people would, yeah. people did complain, but we were going, yeah, it was only on for half an hour. Yeah, then. it's art. <laughs> <laughs> it's but he, art. No, but he was, in, <laughs> he was inspired by The Clash, who had Futura, Futura 2000, yeah. and he wanted to do that because, I don't know, he got bored with the House Martin things, I suppose. Yeah, so that's kind of my rough schooling. That's mad. And that was... So what era, what date was that? Well... I think I was already going on tour doing the uh, painting, is that, if that's what you mean, around 86, 87, yeah, 86, 87, I was on tour painting. But that, but then, so Dub Bigger To Me came out. Yeah, that must have been in the 90s, though. So that was, a, so there, it was later on then? There was a previous version. There was Norman Cook's International Roadshow, and we used to go up and down the UK to all colleges and stuff like that. Really? Yeah. Phil Jupiter used to come on tour with us, if you know who that is, yeah, the yeah. comedian. He was Porky the Poet back then. So I'm mean, really going all over the place here, but he, I'm he, loving it. he was the first one. Him. He had the, uh, karaoke tapes. He was maybe the first person in the UK to have a set of karaoke tapes. And he would, we would use them, and Norman Cook would get up and sing a song in, in front of people, and then they'd hand out the list, and people could come up and sing. It was just really bizarre. So he, wa he wanted it to be this sort of almost like a travelling circus type thing or something. No, no, it makes sense, but it sounds extremely experimental. Kind of that era of young ones, I guess, and it Red is. Dwarf. It was and... like alternative comedy type thing because Porky would stand up and do his yeah. set. We had MC Wildski and DJ, who was the the bright, bright and rap, other Brighton rapper, doing freestyling and doing set pieces. We had um, a guy called Stuart on the congas, and we had the late um, DJ Streets Ahead used to come on tour oh. with us, scratching and doing routi DJ routines with Norman Cook. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. The South Coast coming into mm. uh, into land and. Doing some crazy. It was a quite an interesting era, yeah. Mm. Oh, that's Norman Cook though. He was firing off all over the place trying to make something happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I got pulled along with it. We went to Japan and Australia and New Zealand and yeah, Africa. We went to Africa. DJ Streets Ahead came to Africa with us. So how old were you at that time? I must have been. That would have been. That's after eighty nine, so it's in the nineties. So I was. I was already in my late twenties. How old am I? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we don't disclose that kind of thing on podcasts. <laughs> yeah, I was in my, I was, must have been in my mid to late 20s. Wow. Yeah. But pole vaulted into public yeah, national... Yeah, I, I saw it all. I saw it all and I thought, oh, okay, this sort of thing is achievable. So it's always good to have an example. That's why I take on spray paint apprentices sometimes, just to so people can see how difficult it is or how difficult it isn't, actually. Because when I think of, just, just sticking with that kind of travelling, touring thing, when, in reference, when I think of Rec and your style, particularly now, it's, it's non-compromising, it's quite bohemian. It's got that, 
you never know where... I've always felt that, actually, with Rec. You never know where you're going to take something. And I think it's kind of part in your nature, isn't it? I think maybe it's because I started off as a visual artist and then I went, got, kind of went straight into uh, graffiti, which is very restricted. So it didn't take long for me to need to bust that open just because creativity is just a rolling thing. Mm. Actually, it is true what you say. Say, like, my, other paint, my painting partner, she won. He uh, developed a really good style, and he's unshakable on that style, mm. and that is his trademark style. I'm more likely to, um, yeah, turn the corner, renew. Flip it on his head. Just renew things. I just maybe get bored. I need to transcend things all the time. I, I, this, the word I've heard regarding she is that he is always in a black book. He was in the old days, yeah. Yeah, that was his thing. He would just always be sketching. Yeah, always, always. And if he wasn't drawing, he'd be coming up with crew names and things like that. He made up loads of really cool crew names. The Freeze Mob, DFM, they were a really good big crew in the sort of mid-90s. Brighton-based, Fire, DFM, Rest mm, in Peace. Rest in Peace. Um, was the king of that. But he had a sort of the oh, kind of the opposite to you, in many respects. That yeah. his regimentedness. Yeah, yeah, he was definitely. Uh, she one was is is definitely more in a in a in an aesthetic kind of cool. Mm. It's kind of fashion based, but it sort of really um, stays within its boundaries. And I think maybe that's why he's a bit more successful than me. That people can they know what they're getting. <laughs> Well, true, but well, to a point. But then, if you're in a crew, you kind of want the dynamics to be different. Yeah. Within the within the members. Mm. Yeah, but that was why we were good together. I think if you want to develop um, style, and that's what we were all about, you do need someone to bounce the thing off, really. Yeah. So where did it all begin then? How did you even get into? How did it? How did it come about? Was it just go, just graffiti? Yeah. Uh, Beach Street. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I was at art college, saw Beach Street, and then I went to the, this is in Eastbourne, I went to art college, and then I went into the library in Eastbourne, I said, is there a book about this stuff? Mm -hmm. And they said, yeah, there is, it's called Subway Art, and I thought, oh, I want it, and they had to order it in from a different library, because not everybody had it back then. So that was my first, that was at 84. So I was first, I started in 84 doing graffiti. Um, I had to train myself, there was no one else painting, I didn't know anybody else. Who, who was into it. Um, so I had to train myself in spray paint techniques and that's the basis of the lesson that I give now. It's to do with doing circles and squares and Whoa. lines without them dripping, that kind of stuff. Really? So you, you self-taught the whole thing? Hmm. Well, you had to, didn't you? It's yeah. not like America, you know, they had... You could have a, a mentor. There was no one for me, no wing for me to go under. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's all right. But I quite like that idea of um, being pioneers. A lot of, obviously, the original New York graffiti guys, a lot of them were pioneers, but not, but then there were lots that were just kind of mm. bubbling under. Yeah. But I love the pioneer attitude. Hmm. Yeah, and actually taking, uh, taking advantage of your situation where you didn't have those influences, but then you were figuring stuff out as you went. And actually, yeah. that's, a, that's way more exciting, than, you know, than nowadays where you've got all these different sorts of caps and everything, you, it. and it's all systematic to yeah. what you want. Like, And the paint was not anywhere near what you've got now, yeah. Uh, I was using a high coat back then, which was a butane-propelled car paint. Yeah. Quite good colours, but yeah. Mm. Unless yellow and pink. <laughs> yeah, but that's the thing. In those days, your your pieces looked like a traffic jam because it was all car colours. Yeah. It was difficult to get any good colours, apart from maybe um, Buntlack. Yeah, <laughs> those, are, that was a, those were the special I days. I couldn't afford that. But you, did you did you have a trick of mixing colours? Was Did that ever come into play? I know Euro used to do that. Mm. But I never really did it. No. Not really. No? Mad. It's mad how far things have gone. What happened when you went to... Did, from from university, when did you when did you land in Brighton? Oh, no, I was in Brighton. You were already in Brighton. So, at that point, 
what was the scene looking like for you? you know? uh, there were a few. There was maybe five or six people painting. If you really want to know about it, um, there's a book coming out. Okay. Coast Kings. Nice. It's it's done by um, a guy called Tom Dartnell. Yeah, H H C Tom Dartnell. Yeah. Yeah. He's um, he's got it in design stage. Wow. He's been going. He's going basically from the earliest days, which probably eighty three maybe to ninety four, and then he's stopping. Well, so that's the golden. That's the well, gold. Well, in right? a way, yeah. It's like it's the it's the bit that it wasn't documented. After that, things were much more steadily documented and. And all of that, but it's pretty amazing. He's so obsessive, really. Mm. But you need to be to do a book, don't you? I you mean, think so, or yeah. to be prolific in any sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Are you like that? I get. I'm obsessive. Yeah, because you know, when I stopped doing graffiti, I started painting Sadie, who became my wife, and I never really stopped painting women ever since. So, I, I've really been into that since. 1990 the lettering gradually fell away and then and I, I've been working with this other woman called Smudge I call her Smudge, it's not her real name <laughs> for the last um, eight, eight or nine years actually really? so if you look on my if you went on my Instagram uh, rec image you'll see uh, pretty much all of the images are of her stretching back Really? Over that time. Like the ultimate muse. Hmm. Yeah. So I'm having to write a book about that because people go, oh, a muse, what's that? And I have to explain. Yeah, you know. I kind of want to stick with this muse thing for yeah. a second because, uh, as we know, like, graph writers get obsessed with their letters. Some some writers can only write their names, mm. you know. Mm. That obsessiveness comes from somewhere. But when you actually transfer that to a physical being, and and I get it because if... If you, I mean, there's loads of beautiful examples out there, <laughs> but when you get the, def the definitive thing and you take complete and utter inspiration from it, mm. that's a whole different mindset, isn't it? It is, in a way. You obviously are starting off a bit like a graffiti writer where you're, you've got the structure, which is the body, and then you've got the subtlety of the curves which is the sort of kink in the letters, for instance. Yeah. So I sort of replaced the, the lean and, and the curl and the bounce of the letters for an actual form. But then what happens is after, the, after a time of uh, staying on the, on the surface level of uh, observing a person, things start to merge and you're not quite sure where you are and where she is. This is a little bit... Um, esoteric sounding perhaps but in the end the idea of a muse um it wasn't 100 percent her it was sort of 50 percent as if the muse was internal and external and it's more like a creative force Whoa. so this is the sort of stuff it's a pathway towards some kind of understanding that's how i've that's what's happened for me anyway so when i write my book it's going to be about this um yeah visual pathways to understanding in life yeah because mm. what you're what you're explaining there which i guess is the ultimate kick is when you lower your uh energy to a zen and then uh the diamonds come out of the rough and you're That's it. and what you're looking at is yeah is that that, that the gold that you search for that mm. goes beyond the, the person you're painting. Yeah, that's right. So it's something like love, but it's not like a, a needing love, that person and me. That, you yeah. know, it's not like bodies. It's about the flow yeah. and the one sort of feeling. Do you, do you clock that moment when you're in that energy? Oh, well, it, it just crept up over the years. Wow. Until you're seeped in it and that is all there is. Wow. It's like a sort of mellow understanding. I think a lot of spiritual paths talk about those types of things, but they don't talk about the thing out there. Normally you're, in, you're encouraged to go inwards and then you, you merge with your true self or whatever they call it. You know? Yeah, yeah, you do. You do. Sorry about this. Have we gone too far? No, I'm not. <laughs> no, no. It's your podcast, my friend. We're going in. Yeah. We are going in. I've been waiting five years for this. Um, no, um, Graf... 
um, and from my limited experience of it, um, when you're painting, there is that level of zen. I think as you get older in graph, your needs within graph change. It's useful. It's a very good thing, actually, graph, because it's sort of, it seems really restrictive. And in fact, any restrictive form actually is, is almost like a, a plant in a pot that it can then grow against. Somehow. Yeah. It can force into it, into it almost. You can take it virtually anywhere. Yeah. There's much more fashion for the sort of bombing style um, these days, but coming out of the 80s, it was all about style. It was a bit like uh, B-boys moving with style, up rocking, dressing fly and all that kind of stuff. That's the era we come from. Mm. Uh, it's a bit like mod kind of dressing in some ways. They t took a lot of pride in the way they looked and the way they moved, and the style of graffiti sort of was kind of interwoven with that. Mm. So people were battling other people, not by not necessarily by having them more pieces up, but by rocking the the deafest style, yeah. as we would call it. Yeah. Having the biggest, the most maybe big, but sometimes it's to do with the lean and the angle and how you can kind of freak people's mind. They read it and they go, "Oh my god, look what he's done with that oh. R or something." You know? Yeah, because sometimes the attack on a letter. That's that can set off a whole piece, and then you're saying to yourself, "Well, I can't, I can't even touch that. That is just that's no. right." I mean, you make it unbiteable because people are going, "I don't even know how he drew that," yeah. and you try and draw it, and then it doesn't really work. No, but in those days, me and she we were developing a wild style, I suppose, and yeah, we I don't know. We deliberately overturned the, the rules as we were handed them in, in you know, in, mm. in um, style wars, right? Scene is at the wall painting next to um, Duster. Yeah. And he's going, your first outline's always needed, he says. You can't just go and colour in in the air. You can't just fill in in the air. And we go, right, OK, we're not <laughs> going to do a first outline anymore. We're going to just fill in in the air. And then he said, you've got to have your cloud and whatever, you know, like your 3D and things like that. And we go, right, we're not doing those anymore. So we were reactionarily sort of uh, going, right, we're not, gonna, we're not going traditional anymore. We're going to go opposite to what Scene said and hopefully grow our own thing. That's incredible. It's reactionary version. It's not true creation. It's bouncing off of a structure. So it was almost like a negative of it. But coming out of that, you know, the reason for it, it's like any subculture. I always think of a band like the Beatles or the Kinks who mm. started off playing cover versions of American music and then at a certain point they went, no. Break it. We can do this ourselves. Yeah. And then when they did, that's when it just went amazing. Yeah, so, it's good to have the stabilisers, but they need to come off eventually. Yeah, but you learn your trade with those. So mm. I learned um, spray can control doing graph, and then we started freaking the letters, and then um, I started doing realism with graph. So I got my style spray paint realism, I call it. Yeah, you, you were one of the early adoptees to that, that's for sure. Yeah, but that was a lot to do with Belton. Uh, they started. They brought out those uh, the transparent colours, and my style is dependent on those because you can get a lot of yeah. subtlety of blending. Yeah. So technology made that style happen. Technology plays a role in absolutely everything, and it's nice when there becomes this, you know, cause trip hop for its time. You know, the instrumental hip hop was a thing. Do you well, mean? that was what they said I was when I made my music. Yeah, I recall that. But the truth was, it was just technology taking a foot step forward. And also, we didn't have many rappers. Yeah, true. So it was easier. And in fact, actually, it was coming out of a kind of uh, hallucinogenic house club vibe where people didn't want loads of talking. They just wanted the, the groove of the beats and the colour of the beats and everything so they could move to it. But they didn't want some guy telling them what they should be thinking. Yeah, about. yeah, because there was a lot of that, that thing. Because you had the garage thing emerging into drum, bass and jungle and then you had hip-hop and it was all very voice, voice, voice. Yeah, some of it was, yeah. And that's what I liked about that. That was a good movement. It was a great movement, man. Mm. And, then, and Brighton and Bristol really, you know, uh, sank in the waters over in these places, you know. Mm. <laughs> it's just different ways of thinking things through. But Well, yeah. that's because we're outside London, I think. I think people feel like um, styles are sort of somehow made uh, concrete somehow in... 
London and it's hard maybe for people to step outside of their genres. Yeah, I would say so. I would say so. It can be restrictive. Yeah. So when I come up to London and I look at all the graph, I just think, hmm. But, you know, it's different. People are doing stuff illegally. Mm. They've got to put up what they know. There's no time to be experimenting and stuff like that. It's what the Halls of Fame's are for, really, isn't it? Yeah. But, I mean, Brighton had a really good train scene. And in most part, yeah, it's still active. I was never... Just to make it clear to all you people out there, I was never the illegal guy. We had walls. We were, like, laid-back, kind of Brighton hippie types, really. We were just looking for the derelict spots and just sort of chilling out in the daytime, just experimenting with these kind of letter forms. Yeah, yeah we weren't they... running around being trying to be hardcore. We were being hardcore with style, though. That's, mm. We were doing the style rock. Yeah, yeah, style, it was everything. And Brighton had it in its droves. Yeah, it just took a few people to sort of... And, but the fact is, like I said, like we were saying at the beginning, we had the spots to paint. If you didn't have the spots to paint, there's nothing can develop. No one can come and see it. You can't build a reputation. So it's all about, like this shop here, we're, you know, we're in Chrome and Black. It's a hub somehow. Yeah. People come here, they meet here, and then it's it sort of a scene can develop around a little... Yeah, I might just add, the, the shop is open. You know what I mean, we're doing the podcast, people coming in and out, this is exactly what it's all yeah, about. Yeah, I, I love that, because we're right <laughs> underneath the train line. Yeah. It's just like, makes me feel so urban, I can't take it. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> but um, uh, moving on slightly, who... who what other names were around at the time of uh, Fuck Is Stopist? And, you know, because from, from Petro. my... Petro. Of course, Petro. Petro and Elk were living in Brighton at that time. Which is why they... Because, uh, yeah, I remember that stuff being about, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So I met... Well, Petro, he's a great guy. He's just a lovable giant. Elk's like this kind of precise sort of... Kind of slightly roguish gentleman, you know. He's yeah, he is, yeah. Fantastic okay, characters. Mm. yeah. Mm. Siege, he used to be down Siege, there. Siege, yeah, mm. as well. Yeah. Mm. And there was a whole bunch of them outside of Brighton. You know, it used to, I don't know, for me, it was, a, it was kind of like a, a meeting point, thanks to the Hall of Fames that were allowing yeah. that kind yeah. of communication. There was a lot of NEMA stuff around. Yeah, 100% NEMA, um, TPG, mm. yeah, and the like. Yeah, well, that's kind of the era where that was my golden era, I suppose. And then I, I just dropped out of it. I got into the music and I stopped painting walls. Because for my money, I would say that you were, you were certainly up there on the street. There was. I, I can still picture your your pieces now, both you and she. Mm. These fucking like robotic, fucking big bastard letters. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like really, a thought out, but b recognisable mm. like there wasn't anybody else doing that stuff mm. at the time yeah do you know what I mean yeah well, that's because we turned away from the mainstream style we'd get crossed out by other people if they were too staunch in their style they'd think this is too way out but it was never that way out we were structuring our letters on proper graffiti vernacular <laughs> but if you hadn't seen it all you wouldn't know it all so if you hadn't seen all of the history You'd think that we were really out on a limb, but actually we're just little nods here and there, all in the melting pot of our styles, you know. It's kind of funny now because it, you being, you know, almost like 20 years ahead nowadays, there's a lot of that, I, without question, that fault line lies within the cues that should be taken to what you guys had done. It's all gone. That's the interesting thing about graph, isn't it? If it's not documented, it all just... It's like ephemera, it just sort of fades off and then it's all about who's doing things now. It's like anything, really. You've got to be active now, really. But, but is it? Because when I... I guess that's... It, yeah, holds true in your memory, doesn't it? Because it is a throwaway culture. Mm. But that kind of... It's good and bad at the same time, isn't it? You, know, you could go on the internet and look up someone's name. So people could look up my name. But it's still not as good as turning a corner and just saying, what? Who's it by? And go, this guy wreck, you know. Yeah. That really, the impact fills your whole field of vision and you go, what? Yeah. That. yeah. On a screen, on your phone, it's just like... Oh. Doesn't do it. But do you think people are sanitised by that? You know, from that nowadays, with street art being the way, you know, it's morphed into 
to what it's become? Oh, the visual stuff. It's not about lettering so much. Well, you know, that's a whole other game, you know. I like it. But, you know, I was already an artist, so I can do visual images and, you know, I can do the sort of realism, let's put it that way. So it's good that you can... Someone who's got can control can actually make a career out of it now, which you couldn't really do. Obviously, you've got to maybe leave your lettering behind a little bit but, mm. and develop some other... Um, yeah, visual trick element or something. How does what you do from a painting point of view, how does that merge in your mind with music production? Like, what, what mindset do you go into or do you, mm. is it one and the same? Mm. I remember when I first started doing music, I was, felt like I was just transposing somehow. Because <laughs> it's like colour theory when you're thinking about um, um, a colour wheel, say, You've got the spectrum of colours. It's as if it's been unfolded and then the spectrum is coming up this way with the base having a certain hue, depending on how you feel it, and then coming up to the lighter colours here. So mm. um, when, you, when you're making a painting, you're balancing colours of different brightnesses and also different specific hues. And then in the same in music then, isn't it? You've got a certain amount of bass and you think, right, I would need a certain brighter colours here and a little ticky ticky thing there and some other little objects in the composition. So that was how I approached it. Do you, do you see colours, like, because I saw sort of synesthesia, do you see things differently? Because like, what you've just explained there is kind of a, a very different uh, ensemble to what you'd probably pick up sonically. Yeah, I don't know. I've only got this, so I don't know. I've never been diagnosed. <laughs> That's interesting. It's yeah, interesting it just seems it's... to be the way it works. I've just got recently got into making music on um, VCV rack, which is a virtual modular synth. Um, free, virtual, you should try it. It's quite tricky to begin with. Free virtual modular synth. And you can think of a sound and then pull in the modules and then there are modules for everything. I don't know, so you can make colours in the textures and the morphing... Yeah, it's quite good. Really? Yeah. I mean, we were old trip heads, really, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sir. Yeah. You think? <laughs> well, it was mm. incredible. I mean, like, when you move into, like, AI and the way the world is going technologically, um, my God, when I think about the conversations I had five years ago about these sorts of things, didn't even exist. But, you know, while we're on the subject of doing stuff online and working with synths that are, you know, modular-based, working with, mm. you know, whatever. They're, I mean... This it's going to revolutionise everything. In fact, it's probably going to bring art and music even closer together than we ever thought it possibly could. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah, because you can make visuals linking in with sound using those little Raspberry Pi things or whatever it is, you know, them things. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you can merge the whole lot if you want. I'm sort of quite happy staying in my paint with a brush or, you know, strokes in the real world. Yeah, I yeah, love yeah. that and then um, making sound and then punching it out of a speaker, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's something very it's true, isn't it? Mm. So what's the day in the life of Rick then? So, you know, I couldn't just imagine this, like, Aladdin's cave of just, like, loads of... I might play with this today, I might do that today. <laughs> uh, look at that up there, that's like, well, I might just do that today. Well, I mean, there's going to be... Like, what's it can day? be, yeah, it can be. But I, I have some regular things I do. I run a street art tour in Brighton. On Wednesdays and Saturdays, um, just talk, walking around, talking about stuff like that. So yeah. that's one of my structures. Um, I run a drawing club on a Thursday night. In fact, I should be back because this is Thursday. Um, um, I should be back um, tonight to go to get to be there. You know. Anyway, so I have only a few structure things, um, and then I'm stringing between um, commission pieces. Ah. So last night I was finishing off a mural in Hastings, St. Leonard, Leonard's actually, um, uh, of my muse swimming underwater. It's a really pretty big mural um, with a couple of other cool street art guys as well. Yeah. So that kind of thing. I did a big hotel painting the other week. So it seems to be all right this time of year. Um, and I've got a few more things coming up. So I'm going for those commission things, but still, it's not very predictable. Yeah, yeah. But then I'm always making my own paintings as well. 
This is where you flick them up on the screen. Yeah, yeah. Bing! Yeah, you so, go. Yeah, 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 yeah. That kind of stuff. <laughs> um, looking back to now, <laughs> you in your career, did you ever think you'd be at this point and, what, know, on the Killer Callus podcast? Of course, no, I couldn't believe. Of course, why would I you wouldn't. not? <laughs> yeah. But to, to forecast a life as an independent artist, hmm. I think for a lot of people, and I know my mum and dad would definitely testify to this comment, they just, they, they just shut off. They're just like, well, you, how? How are you surviving, man? Like, I think everyone asks that same question to every single artist, even if they are artists, how do we survive? Did you ever think that you'd get to this point in your life where you're still doing exactly what you want to do against every single core principle mm. of um, education and work. Yeah. I, mm. You get to a point where you've realised you haven't got much choice and that everything has been sort of... Uh, all, all of the steps I've taken in my life have led to this thing, so, you know, I can't just suddenly leap off one, to one side and mm. then try and be a nine-to-fiver or something. Mm. Too, I'll, I'll have to retire soon anyway, when I? I'm pretty <laughs> old. <laughs> what, 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 retire of the nine-to-five that you never had? Yeah, exactly, right yeah, my imaginary yeah. nine-to-five. Yeah. Maybe no, you can no. skip that and just go straight to the retirement. And yeah, then. I'll just go straight to dead. I think that'd be all right. <laughs> Art dead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I hear that's, that's, the, that's the ongoing problem for a lot of artists. <laughs> and then I get really popular when they have passed, right? <laughs> Maybe we can fake my death. <laughs> the, the ultimate... Art sacrifice. It's fake, though. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. Of course. Don't tell them, OK? Don't tell them. <laughs> the Machiavelli. So if I die, right, that's why. But only, only me and you know. That's right? it, that's okay. it. Between, between yeah, us. yeah. You can handle the estate of, of yeah. Wreck. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then feed me my millions. Come we <laughs> in. <laughs> Wreck, man, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thanks, it's man. It's been absolutely Good to see you awesome. Again. Thank you so much for joining us here. Uh, Killer Keller podcast, Chrome and Black. Once again, big up zombies, first one, people, all right? Teethings and everything, but we're here. We're here, out here um, every single week. So, yeah, big up yourselves. Uh, sharing is caring. Remember, tell a friend, tell a friend, all right? Crime don't pay, but neither do they. Don't talk to an hour, wouldn't you? Stay lucky, people. Nice little wreck. Bruce! <laughs> <laughs> that was that. That was good.